Hey everybody, it is Wintermute, coming to you from the Think Tank. So, I am going to start a new series, as life permits. So, it may be a little uh, erratic in when I get to upload the videos, but that's just life. Um, and we're going to talk explicitly about technology in version 4. Now, I had done a series like this for version 3, and I got very good feedback on it, That uh, you know, so I and I enjoyed doing it. Uh, and the goal was to kind of talk about uh, tech, I, what I did is I did one video about technology overall, and then I did nation by nation, and I talked about what technologies were best for that nation in a general sense, and kind of you know created an unofficial tier list. It wasn't anything formal; just kind of talked about what worked well for for what nation. Uh, based on the circumstances of the game, um, and what's and some texts that some nations just couldn't care less about, and there are some. Um, so I'm going to do that with version four. Now, I haven't had many games of version four, as there there are many people out there that have had a ton of games with version four. So why am I going to do this video now? Well, I want to do this video now before I get a ton of experience with version four. And I want to talk about how I feel about the technology and the options uh, for each nation before I get a ton of experience. And then I want to revisit this series in uh, a year, two years, 20 years, depending on what the lifespan of version 4 is. Uh, but at some point, I want to be able to kind of go, okay, well, here's how I look at it now. Here's how I rationalize it now. Here's how I feel about it now. But then am I going to feel the same way, you know, 30 games from now or 50 games from now? And so I want the opportunity to be able to kind of like document what I'm saying now uh, and then compare it, you know, for you know, from looking back on this time. Uh, I think that could be a, a kind of a neat thing. And just to see if things change. Now, things may not. You know, maybe maybe the way I kind of feel kind of gets solidified. And, oh, okay, you know, this is just always kind of a, these are the top tier texts for this particular nation. Uh, but it's always possible that I encounter somebody who kind of has a completely different view and they show it to me and they execute it. And I kind of go, oh, well, okay. Wow, okay, I have to really reevaluate re how I feel about that technology now because I, I would have never even considered that one before for that nation for that reason. And that's one of the fun things about a game like this is there's plenty of opportunity to do that. So that's the, that's the goal. Now, obviously, I, I don't have the map yet. I'm going to go ahead and record this on uh, using Tabletop Simulator and this uh, community-made map. This map has, as far as the, the community people in charge of it, has all of the updates uh, that for version 4 that we are aware of. Now, is it 100% perfect? Probably not, but it's enough to kind of wet your whistle when you play with it. Just get in there and kind of work with the rules, play with the rules, you know. Uh, there's a lot of big rules that change, and so just getting to fiddle with them, even if the, the C-zones aren't quite cut exactly like you, they might be in the end, uh, that still is an excellent opportunity right now. So I, I, I believe it was uh, uh, Madman Dan and... Uh, the the uh, Dailer, I believe his name is. I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. I believe those are the two people who have to kind of taken charge of this particular project. And uh, I want to say I want to say that I appreciate you guys doing this um, and then sharing this with the community as a whole because it's given us a chance to get in there, get under the hood, and experience the game uh, before the big release, which is going to help, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's just fun. It's enjoyable. It gives us a better idea of what to expect. Let's us get under the hood before everything is finalized as well and gives important feedback. Um, if there's somebody who was involved in this project and I, I, I'm not aware of them, then please feel free to let me know in the comments so they can get a shout out. Cause I think that's important to, to recognize people when they go the extra mile and they do something for the community that is, is really beneficial. So I appreciate it. And I, I know I am probably talking on behalf of all, you know, most, if not all of the other players in the community to, to at least those people who I know had their hand in this project. So let's go ahead and dive in. So there's been a couple key changes to uh, factories, or in effect, but technology that are, are really worth noting. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that a damaged factory offers no uh, tech dice. Now, of course, in version 3, it didn't either. 
But now the repair to the factory doesn't take place until the end of the turn that it's paid for. Meaning once it's damaged, it's going to miss a turn in, in the uh, being able to roll for technology. Uh, and that already, I have already seen that that is, is a, an uh, excellent improvement to the game as a, as a whole. It raises the ante, raises the stakes, uh, and, you know, uh, makes things, makes bombing more important, um, depending on how high you value tech or your opponent values tech. Uh, there are some people who absolutely just kind of shrug and say, I don't consider tech a huge part of the game, so I don't really invest a lot in it. And other people feel uh, obviously differently, and there's everyone in between. But if you're playing against somebody who is uh, really gung, you know, gung-ho, this gives you an opportunity to kind of like stymie their efforts based on, on, on things and kind of plan around that and actually have an impact on, on things beyond, uh, you know, in, in that arena, which we didn't really traditionally have. So I really, I really like that. I do, do like that addition. Uh, there, so there's that. That that limits. Well, let me let me point out a couple couple th differences. So just like version three, you cannot research past this stage here. Um, stage three cannot be developed before July of 1939. So at that date, you're able to start researching state past stage two into stage three, and that's just like it was in version three. Now, another big change is USA cannot develop technology until it reaches 10 IPP income. And the USSR cannot develop technology until it reaches 15 IPP income. So between the, oh, and, and I'm sure anybody watching this already knows, there are additional technologies added to the game now that, so there's more technologies overall. So all that comes together to mean that there's going to be there's there's going to be less technology dice overall in the game and on top of that there are more decisions to make when you look at your options for technology so that has the effect of making the decisions you make about technology all that much more important a uh, little little tense a little you know it's like a little bit of a nail biting there to to make sure that you're you're investing in the right thing um, cause you're going to have, you're going to have less, you know, overall, you're going to probably end up with less dice depending on what nation you play. Uh, or, and, and that's not true of every nation because you may play Britain and you may uh, never have, uh, the Germans or the Italians bomb a major factory. You may have, or never have J Japan do it to, to, if you build a major factory down in Anzac, you, that may never happen. So you may never notice it, but in a general overall sense, there's still going to be less tech dice in the game just because of the way Russia and the USA roll their dice now. Uh, and then it can be even expounded upon if people start actually targeting and bombing other fa bombing the enemy's factories. Um, that also has the consequence of possibly making it harder to pivot text, but we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, another thing that's worth pointing out is units that become available after developing technology cannot be lend leased. And so that's it. That is a change from version three. Uh, and I've even talked with someone who says, oh, I love giving jet fighters to free France because then they terrorize Italy and, and you know, Germany wherever they can uh, down around the Mediterranean. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's actually kind of a, a neat idea, but that's just not going to happen in this game. Um, you just cannot lend lease technology unit, te technological units anymore. So... Let's talk about the individual technologies. Now, before I dive all the way into these individual technologies, I want to um, cover two things. I, I kind of want to distinguish between two kind of classifications of technology as I see them in my mind. And that is the delayed tech and the immediate tech. And a delayed tech is one that you get the tech but then you have to build the unit in order to use it. But an immediate tech is one that takes effect right away. And right off the bat, you're thinking, you know, you can think of, you know, like uh, heavy carriers and, and uh, heavy battleships being an example of a delayed tech. You research it and then you can start building those units and those built units may take time to build and then they hit the water and then they get into play. As opposed to long range aircraft, where long range aircraft, as soon as you get it, you get it it affects the board and it, it immediately 
has an impact on the game. And I think mentally there's a there's a reason I distinguish those two, and I think a lot of players do too. And that's because you've got to make some decisions about when you're rolling for tech and how much of an impact it's going to have, especially towards the end of the game. Uh, because if, if you've got five turns left and that's when you decide to start rolling for heavy battleships, uh, what is that really going to do for you? As opposed to maybe you, you still have an opportunity to get long-range aircraft, so maybe go for that one. And you may still get uh, a couple turns at the end of the game where you can use it to, to you know harangue your enemy as much as possible. And one thing I do like about version f 4 is... Um, a lot of those techs now are, are, they've got like a crossover. So there's an aspect to them, they're, they're like a blended tech. They're, they're delayed and they're immediate. They have both effects in them. And, and as we talk about them individually, that'll make sense if it, if it doesn't, if you're kind of not already picturing what I'm talking about. But, all right, so on to advanced mechanized infantry. Um, so these are pretty straightforward. You just improve stats and they can pair two to one with blitzing armor uh and it also allows germany to build ss panzer grenadiers oh there was one other thing i wanted to talk about and and actually this is a great example so if you you can now as opposed to version three build tech advanced te technology units outside of your home country so i can build uh, I can go on and I can build, let's say Germany has Poland or Romania and they've got still got those factories there. I can go there and I can build advanced mechanized infantry there. However, the nation specific units still have to be built in your home country. And that is an important thing to remember as you are planning out your builds. Uh, and just uh, in a game I was in a couple weeks ago, I went and I, as part of my German builds, I built uh, two advanced mechanized infantry. Uh, and I, uh, the, one of the other players pointed out, oh, you know you can make those Panzer Grenadiers because you haven't built any of those yet this turn. I go, yes, I know, but I, I want them to be regular advanced mech for a very specific reason. And he goes, oh, right, no, I understand. And that's because I wasn't 100% sure where I was going to put my units yet, wh which units I was going to drop in Warsaw and Romania. Um, and if I had built the SS Panzer Grenadiers, or built those two advanced mech as Panzer Grenadiers, then they would have had, I would have had no choice but to put them back in Germany somewhere, uh, as opposed to closer to the front line. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, it turns out that I ended up putting them back in Eastern Germany anyway, but I wasn't, but I, I left my, my options open when I built them. So that is one thing to consider. And that's true of any kind of uh, nation-specific unit. So Panzer Grenadiers, uh, Tiger Ones, um, Katyushas, uh, what's the other Russian one, the, the T-34s, uh, anything like that has to be built in home country. So uh, back to Advanced Mech. So Advanced Mech, there it, it's really good. It's really good for any kind of army that is gonna be very engaged in a lot of land combat. Advanced artillery. Yeah, this one's very straightforward. Um, you know, these attrition attacks, I haven't seen many made with them. Uh, most people want to use this to actually attack with because they love rolling that first strike on that attack of four, especially those kind of yushas. Um, but yeah, both these techs are just absolutely straight up upgrades to your units. And you're going to have, you know, there's most nations will want that. Radar. Okay, so radar in this edition has a couple modifiers to it. So defending convoys gain plus two to their convoy roll. Bases and major naval facilities may scramble an unlimited number of units. Um, now, I'll be honest. Uh, air bases, I've never, ever seen anybody even have more than three fighters at a single air base. Um, so I don't know how often that actually happens. Uh, so I generally, when I look, when I think of radar, I don't, I don't think of it for that. That's like an afterthought. But now that it includes major naval facilities, and now you can scramble an unlimited number of units from them, that's a whole nother ball of wax. That's a whole nother game to have to think about. And that may make that much more desirable based on the circumstances that you are looking at on the board. And I, I'm not going to pretend that I have a lot of experience with that. And then fighters gain the plus one interception. Uh, facilities, inherent anti-aircraft may shoot at strategic rockets, and we're going to come back to that one in a bit. 
uh, fighters able to intercept are able to intercept and scramble from heavy fleet carriers. So obviously you need heavy fleet carriers as well. And you add this to heavy fleet carriers and you've got the, you kind of see the dawn of the modern carrier as we know it. And plus six modifier to opposing battlecruiser die roll. So that means if you are trying to track down a battlecruiser that is in raider mode, you get a plus six modifier to any dice that you are rolling to do that. Um, now this has a plus six modifier to opposing battlecruiser die roll. I am not assuming that the battlecruiser gets that plus six modifier if that the owner has radar. I don't believe that is how that works. I believe this is just for tracking down battlecruisers in raider mode. So ASW is uh, very similar to what it was in version three. But like anything, it's got a, a, a mod, uh, something tacked onto it, which is new to consider. Convoy lines gain automatic plus one defender modifier to a convoy role, essentially an inherent escort ship. When submarines raid a convoy line of a nation with ASW technology, the defender gets a defensive role at plus two against each raiding submarine. In regular combat, all naval transports defend at one against attacking submarines. I like that. And seaplanes on map get a plus two attack bonus against submarines. So that adds a little bit of a threat to seaplanes, more than, than what they already had, uh, if you go for anti-submarine warfare. And that all kind of makes sense. It all kind of works together. Improved factories. So this is uh, pretty much just like it was in version three. Uh, miners become two. Mediums become five, majors become eight, minor shipyards can produce two, major shipyards can produce eight. Uh, in captured improved factory or shipyards give no benefit to the captor, and the USSR, after developing this technology, may build the T-34. And that's interesting that the T-34 is actually tacked on to improved factories as opposed to any sort of armor technology. And if you know the history of the T-34, it actually kind of makes sense, and I, I'll spare you. But uh, I do like that they added that to improve factories for Russia. That, that's, that's very neat, and I like that. That's very cool. Improved construction. Okay, this one has something added, which is very important. Uh, so all facilities and ships cost my, minus one IPP per stage, or a player may pay for the first two construction turns at the same time. This is a faci facility that costs 666 would be built for 12-6. Um, I can, you know, if you are playing, so if, you, if you can think ahead and you can really think about what you're going to build f as far as facility goes, and you get this technology and, and you know, this is fantastic to, to put your facilities down at that cheaper rate, especially if it's a multi-stage facility, you know, being able to put down a, uh, uh, an air base for, and only pay four over two turns is, you know, yeah, that just the, the economy saved goes into other things that need to go fight the war. And that feels really good. But sometimes you don't have that luxury and you just got to get it dropped and you got to get it into the fight. And that is fine. And that is what makes this this other uh, ability that it has just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I have certainly, you know, used this one quite a bit, you know, uh, it, when you, you, uh, you know what, I need an airfield there, or I need a fortification line right there. I just got to pay for it right now. It'd be nice to save the money, but I ain't going to have time. If I don't get it there, I ain't going to have the chance. And then this is new. Minor factories reduce damage from strategic bombing by one, medium factories by three, and major factories by five. And we're going to come back to that again as well. Airborne Doctrine. Now, Airborne Doctrine, um, you know, it immediately upgrades, upgrades all your airborne infantry. And then you can build uh, heavy air transports, which are able to carry two airborne into an airborne assault. And in the non-com phase, they can transport one artillery, one anti-aircraft artillery, or one infantry class in non-combat movement. Um, heavy air transports have a move of six and cost 10. Your elite airborne cost three. Now there's a, some interesting facets to this one. First off, it's kind of a hard one to judge in some ways when it comes to, when I start talking about individual nations, because to go this route is almost like a strategy unto itself. Um, and you know, now obviously it's better for some nations than others. And we'll talk to that. We'll talk to that point, but it's, 
to take airborne doctrine and and go all the way and try to get the whole thing, it's uh, you know you're kind of setting a you're setting a very particular you're 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 kind of showing your hand a little, and the opponent can kind of go okay he's going for his airborne doctrine how do I counter that do I build more fighters do I build more AA what do I what do I need to do do I need to make sure my backfield at least has some some units in there. Now another interesting caveat to this is. These elite airborne infantry are just automatically 3-3, three, three, move into 1, and cost 3. So basically, you can just look at them as 3-3 three, three infantry units, as opposed to 2-4 infantry units. And you could use them like regular infantry if you wanted to. I know the uh, Advanced Spanish Civil War expansion had sh the concept of shock units, I believe they were, uh, in shock infantry units in there, and those were 3-3 three, three, Moving to one, price of three. Um, and so even if you don't plan on dropping a whole lot of airborne, uh, but you just want infantry that you, you don't care that it defends as well, you want it to be able to attack a little bit better, you can just build two of these guys a turn and sail them off to wherever you need them. So that's an interesting way to kind of look at the elite airborne infantry. Now, of course, having a having a, a air transport somewhere to, to carry them around and project that threat is obviously very desirable. But if that ain't an option and you want 3-3 three, three infantry, yeah, you can build two a turn now. So, uh, yes, so these are all, so far, all the ones that I've looked at, um, with the exception of the first two. The first two are what I talked about, the kind of delayed techs. But they don't delay very long, because the turn you get them is the turn you can start building them. Um, now, obviously, if you if you're getting these these two technologies on the last couple turns of the game, they may not have a huge impact. But all the other ones that I talked about are up until Airborne Doctrine are a are kind of immediate. You get it, and then it takes effect, and you can start getting the benefit from it. Airborne Doctrine is one of those ones that is a mixed one, because as soon as you get it you immediately upgrade all your airborne units. They all become three threes. The ones that are on the board all upgrade. So that's an immediate effect. But at the same time, you can now build heavier transports, which you will need to spend time and money to build and then get them into play. So there's this is one of those those hybrid ones which has an immediate effect and a delayed and kind of a delayed ability to build the units. Or it's delayed for you to be able to build the units. You know what I mean. And amphibious doctrine falls in that same hybrid category. Um so at right away, as soon as you get this doctrine, uh, infantry class units do not suffer double casualties on the first round of combat when amphibiously assaulting. So that's immediate. That's, that takes effect right away. And then you are also able to build attack naval transports. And attack naval transports cost the exact same as a regular naval transport, but they're better. Uh, they all have a defense value of one. Marines attacking from... Uh, assault transports get plus one, and then all land units can participate in an amphibious assault from the first round of combat. So any tanks and artillery that you send in with those uh, infantry in the first wave get to land on shore. So that's a big improvement, and I really like that this gives this this ability right here, the second one with the Marines gaining the plus one attack, because I what I tended to see is a lot of Marines get built early in the game uh, for nations that need to use Marines, like Japan, for example. And then they sort of taper off. They've caught what they needed. They've got the land. Then they just sort of solidify. And after that, maybe they get the uh, they get assault transports, and then they uh, just start using those. And the Marines sort of you know languish if there are any even left. Um, but now Marines, there's a purpose to keep building Marines in that plus one attack. That may be a very important thing, uh, especially if you're spread thin and you're trying to do a lot. Well. Having your Marines, two Marines landing off one of those guys attacking at threes can, can, be a, can be a swing in a close battle. So I like that, that that breathes life back into a unit that I think can taper off in its usefulness in the later game. So that's, again though, this is one of those hybrid ones that I was talking about. So heavy armor, very straightforward. Uh, pretty much just like version 3, except now it costs 7 IPP instead of 8. And that allows Germany to build the Tiger One. Now, I think you're going to see a lot more of these in play because a medium armor costs six. A heavy armor costs seven, but its stats are dramatically improved and it has those target selection, let alone the fact that you may buy a Tiger One as, uh, may buy Tiger Ones as Germany. 
So all around, uh, uh, just a, a great piece of tech that I think you're going to see a lot more people playing with and a lot more pieces on the board. So Jet Fighters pretty much didn't change from version 3. Uh, they are still worth 12. Um, but I understand why this didn't, why these went, were reduced at a point value. These were not. Uh, because jet fighters are, were probably a little more useful. And I've heard somebody kind of make that statement, that jet fighters were still useful in version 3, whereas heavy armor just didn't seem to get built as much. And I kind of get that. I understand that. So I think you're going to see heavy armor a lot more. And jet fighters are just an all-around improvement in general. Um, the interception, you know, they're 8-8, eight, eight, movement of 4, but the interception of 5 and 5 is pretty impressive. That is a, a dramatic improvement over the... the interception values of normal fighters. So obviously they're a lot better at shooting them down and can create interesting situations where, you know, it's like, okay, well, you're escorting with a fighter, two fighters and a bomber, but now I've got a jet fighter and I wasn't going to go up, but now I've got a, I've got a much higher chance to hit than you. Let's roll those dice. And so it's, it's kind of a, I think it can be, when it comes to interception, it can almost be, these jet fighters almost become a, a force multiplier onto themselves because their stats are so much better. Let alone if you've got radar and then this becomes a 6-6 six, six for interception. Then you're hitting 50% of the time against units that may only be hitting 25% 25, 25 of the time. So long range aircraft. Uh, slight improvement to this one, or slight change. Strategic bombers and heavy strategic bombers gain two movement. Now, one thing I want to point about this is take a look at the map. And, you know, we're used to counting out, okay, start here at this air base and you count out seven spaces and then kind of where can it land. And, and But as soon as, it can, as a heavy bomber can start going, or strap bomber and strategic heavy bombers can start going nine spaces when they're taking off from an airfield, um, their reach is really out there. Like, really sit down and count that out one day, it, especially if you're somebody who doesn't really use strategic bombers very often. You know, start counting a one, two, three, four, you know, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah. It's like you realize how much more reach you have into Europe. And to be able to come back and or come down to North Africa and land in a safe border here, Gibraltar, you can really kind of do this, this, you know, you a, a lot that opens up a lot of bombing options. Uh, all of their craft game plus on movement, medium bombers game plus one map range. And if you're somebody who doesn't use seaplanes very often, um, medium bombers getting that plus one map range is pretty it's going to be pretty important. And of course, medium bombers have a much higher attack value by default against subs. Um, so. That's always nice to be able to bring that firepower to bear on subs if need be. And then seaplanes get a plus one map range if starting from a seaplane base. Now, they have to start from a seaplane base, so there's not many of them on the... I know there are some going to be some out there on the new map. Um, and that gives them a map range of three. Now, of course, no other unit comes close to that kind of map range. And also remember that seaplanes can now uh, do more than just go after subs. They can actually go raid... Um, do raiding along uh, uh, convoy lines and things like that. So it's sometimes, you, you know, I mean, even here in Paris, if you've got one here in Paris, it goes one, two, three, it can actually start raiding these two lines and, and, and safely go back to Paris if threatened. You don't have to keep it on the coast. So that's one, it, it opens up a, a lot more options. Actually, one, two, three, you can actually get out to here and raid. Uh, of course, you've got to worry about everything else, but it just does open up a lot more options to seaplanes and, and making them, it, like if the subwar ends and you've still got seaplanes, well, what do you do with them now? Well, that's a fair question. And that is, that at least, the fact that they can raid convoy lines, I really like. That, that gives them some life after the subwar may end. And advanced subs. Now, this is another one that's kind of uh, hybrid. Wolf packs, raiding submarines, all types. Doesn't have to be advanced. All types gain plus one to their convoy roll if more than one submarine is raiding the sea zone. Now, note this is you just have to have more than one, and it's not cumulative. So, if you've got three, they're still only all getting plus one, or five, they're still all only getting plus one. Um, but it does give them a little bit more punch later into the sub war 
Um, and uh, if there's like an arms race going on between Britain and Germany, as far as submarines goes, there's some tit for tat. Okay, great. You got radar now. Well, I'm going to get advanced subs. And so I can help that helps me counter your radar. And of course, you get the option of building advanced subs. Uh, higher attack modifier and advanced subs can only be attacked by aircraft on maritime patrol and that goes back to you know um, having the extended range of medium bombers now and possibly seaplanes to be able to get those guys is going to become even more important as a possible counter if somebody's going after advanced subs so i don't see many advanced subs built but i think it's a it's definitely a worthy technology um, if the German player can swing it. But we'll talk more about the nation-specific stuff at a later date. So large ship construction. Now this one is definitely one of those delayed ones um, because you've got to get the tech and then you've got to build the ships. And the ships take, by default, three turns to build. So there's, there's some time there that you have to really invest in that and you've got to really think ahead for this one. Uh, beyond that, these units haven't changed much from the other, the last edition. Um, I think the price went up a one point each for heavy battleships. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's just it's one of those ones that you really got to have some forethought and and how wh how you when you're gonna if you're gonna roll for it when you're gonna roll for it and how you're gonna use it based on the time involved in it. Heavy strategic bombers. These are pretty much exactly like they were in version four or three, I believe. Um, they can carpet bomb with five dice at two, uh, and they can do 3d6 for strategic bombing raids. Uh, so a lot more damage, much higher damage, uh, can deliver a lot more damage. Now, uh, I think there is some, you know, they are, they are more expensive uh, than medium bombers and uh, strat heavy bombers. And, you know, uh, carpet bombing, it's, it's a, high risk high reward kind of thing it i generally would rather be strategically bombing with these guys because that's potentially more economy you know that's more safe economy out of them of course you will have to risk the flak in most cases um but this are you know if you rolling five dice and only hitting on twos you might get lucky and you might score a bunch of hits but if the first couple hits you score are going to be you know militia most likely uh because there's no target selection or anything like that um so it's, it's, I generally prefer a strategic bomb, but I understand the value of carpet bombing, especially if you get two or God forbid, three of them in a single attack. Well, 15 dice at two can have a big impact. Um, but I think that's more of a secondary thought to me personally, when it comes to how to use strategic bombers, um, though it's not useless at all. Then we have strategic rockets. Now this is a really interesting one. These have changed. They don't get to do attrition attacks anymore. Um, it says they can be moved like any other unit. It doesn't give, uh, it does give them a movement of one, but you can also rail them and all that other stuff. They've got a range of three though, and they're single use. And they do 1d6 strategic bombing damage against, uh, any target that is, that you can strategically bomb. And you can only build two of them per turn, which is, I think is different than the last edition, but they only cost three. Now, the way to use strategic rockets, I think there's a lot of potential there if you use them smartly. If you want to just build them and do damage to your opponent to try and make him spend his money repairing, that's fine. It's a little risky. Uh, you know, now, if you've got a bigger economy than them and you think you can get away with that, um, by let's say you're, you know, you're, you're Germany and you're just gonna, you're just gonna bomb the factory every turn and, uh, I've got a bigger economy so I can afford these six IPP for those two guys and then launch them off and then do 2d6 to him. And it should average out to, you know, but it's, I can spend six. And if I do six to him every turn, that's better for me because he's got less money coming in. But, and if you look at it that way, I think that's fair. That's a fine way to look at it. But Another, but I think using them more strategically and surgically is going to pay off dividends in the long run. And let's say, for example, um, the Brit Britain has in C Zone 24, this is where their transports are. And so you start counting out and you go one, two, three. Uh, his transports can reach Western Germany. And I really am worried about that. But I have a rocket in France. That can go one, let's say Paris, one, two, 
three, and it can land and hit that major port on my turn. Now that port, if it gets damaged, is not going to be able to be used that turn by the British player. So he doesn't get that bonus for that major port anymore, that movement bonus for his ships. So now his transports can only reach here. And that takes a lot of pressure off you here if that's something you're worried about. Also, using them to hit air bases in order to get a sur city surrounded or to deny the ability of your opponent to um, scramble aircraft into an adjacent zone and things like that uh, for another attack that you're doing. I think that, that if you use them like that, that they would pay much bigger dividends in the long run than just using them to stack up damage on your opponent. Now that uh, now and and it's every game's different, but that's how I see that's how I want to use these. I want to use them in ways that I'm going to really hurt him in ways he can't do much about. And that brings up another point about strategic rockets is if you there's there's not many ways to counter them if your opponent gets them uh, and he can just sort of use them with impunity. Now, there, but there are some. Now there's radar. Radar gives you the chance to shoot flak at them and, you know, have a 25% chance of shooting them before they land. Um, you can also get improved construction. Oh, it's doing that. Get improved construction. And this way, the chances of them dealing damage is reduced. So if I'm going to just send one after that major factory in London, if I roll a one through three, it does nothing. So those are the two obvious ways to counter strategic rockets when your opponents get them. There is another way, though, with improved logistics. And we'll get into, I might as well bring this up now. Because with improved, let's say your opponent has, you know, uh, ra uh, strategic rockets. And he's nailing your factory every turn. And you're just like, oh my god, this sucks. Um... But I do have improved logistics, and I can now move my factories out of range of where he might put those rockets. Now, I'm just using this area as an example. You know, every game's going to be different. You know, maybe Germany wants to move them off of this coastline here into Berlin. Um, and they usually have some, you know, and, and at certain points of the game, they've got rail to spare to, to move it in there. And same thing with Britain. They've got rail to spare because they don't usually use this rail line in, in Britain very often or in the, uh, the British Isles very often. So maybe they go ahead and move their major factory up out of range of the strategic rockets. Um, so that's another way. So I see kind of three ways to counter. And, you know, you're going to have to kind of pick which one you like if you feel the need to kind of go after a counter. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're just, ah, I'm just going to have to suffer through them. But they're kind of in an interesting spot where, you know, in my mind, where once your opponent has them, what do you do? Can you do anything? And that's the sort of thing that you got to kind of think about with strategic rockets. So I like strategic rockets in general. I haven't had a chance to use them much, but I do like them. And I want to use them more. And our last one is improved logistics. So doubling your strategic rail movement capacity in all regions, that's pretty good for most nations. Most nations are going to want that. Now, obviously, there's some, some exceptions. There's some that, that will want it more than others. But even, even beyond that, um, able to strategic rail move across different rail gauges. Now, that's an important one for various nations for various reasons. Uh, plus one strategic na naval movement. Okay, uh, I'm not a huge fan of strategic mail, naval room movement uh, uh, altogether. Um, I don't think that's a, a huge reason to go after it uh, in and of itself. I think these other, you know, these other three abilities are far more important and far more useful. This is sort of an afterthought to me, but that's me. Maybe I'll feel different in two years. And like I was saying before, you can move factories in home country and uh, it takes one strategic rail movement to move minor or medium and two to move a major factory. Cannot produce any units or technology that turn or be upgraded, the player turn moves. It moves whatever stage of damage it has suffered, and it must remain, remain inside home country. So, you know, that's that's an interesting one uh, for a couple of reasons, because it can do things, you, you can, it's not obvious, some of the options that that opens up for you, I don't think will be obvious. And I'll talk more about them when I talk about the nations, because I've already seen a couple of things that have made me go, oh, wow, I, I never considered that. That's actually a great idea. Um, 
But yeah, so that's just me talking about the technology in general. When I have the time, I will sit down and I will go over each nation in turn order. So we'll start with Germany and talk about what I like about the techs, what I think works for them, what I think they're better off avoiding, um, and kind of just, just talk in general about what I think works for, for the various nations. So if I've said anything that was mistaken about the rules that you know is mistaken, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, if you think um, my, some of my assessments that I've made so far, not that I've made a ton, um, about the various nations, it needs some uh, uh, counterpoints. Uh, maybe I missed something that was obvious that uh, you know I didn't point out, or, or something that worth mentioning about some of these these individual texts, like a, a rule caveat that I, I didn't particularly come to. Uh, yeah, feel free to leave comments below. And for right now, this will be Wintermute signing off.